Hi, Year 11. This is Miss Gordon and Miss Curzons is here as well. Say hello, Miss Curzons. Hello. We are going to do a brief summary of Macbeth for your revision now um, because we know that you will most likely have forgotten a lot about it. So we do encourage you to go back and uh, read over the play, but this will just be a quick summary to remind you of the key points. Okay, we're going to start with a really short overview um, that just gives you a snapshot of what the play is about. So, three witches tell Macbeth that he will be king of Scotland. Driven by his ambition and manipulated by his wife, Lady Macbeth, Macbeth kills Duncan and is crowned the new monarch. However, the bloodshed does not stop there. In order to eliminate any threats to his rule, Macbeth also kills Duncan's guards, his friend Banquo, and the family of Macduff. Lady Macbeth, his wife, is driven, mad with guilt, and eventually kills herself. Convinced that he is invincible, Macbeth continues to fight until he is killed by Macduff, who restores Scotland to its rightful order. So as you know, year 11, this is a tragedy, meaning that it ends in death. And Macbeth is a tragic hero, meaning that he starts off as a character of noble stature, but he experiences a downfall as a result of his fatal flaw, which here is ambition. Okay, so on to Act One. So obviously, you know, the very first scene of the play, it opens up with our three witches. Very short scene, and it's just to introduce this idea of the supernatural in Macbeth, and of course, the witches act as um, as agents of fate. So we have, when we get further on, we'll have Lady Macbeth, but it's just to kind of set up this idea that possibly Macbeth isn't all to blame for the actions um, of the play. We hear a lot about Macbeth before we actually meet him as a character. So the next act two of the play is all about the, the captain's speech, if you can remember, that really famous quotation where he says, he unseemed him from the names the knave to the chap, I think. Is that right, Miss? Yeah, unseemed him from the knave to the chap. He's ruthless. He unzips him. He, he's fantastic. So Macbeth is set up as this very violent character. But the difference from him at the beginning of the play to the end of the play is his violence is on the right side. So his violence here is to be respected and revered because it's winning battles for his king. Yeah, and as you can see, he's going to be rewarded for that. He's going to be given the title of the Thane of Cawdor, which is significant because the previous Thane of Cawdor betrayed the king. He actually fought against King Duncan. And you could argue that by inheriting his title, Macbeth is also inheriting that tendency to betray. So we are pretty, we get the scene first where we are told that Macbeth is to be given the Thane of Cawdor as a reward from Duncan. Then we are shown the scene when Macbeth meets the witches, which bank. So very important scene here because both bank and Macbeth, so bank is Oil. He's equal in status and reputation. He is also giving a prophecy along with Macbeth. Macbeth's prophecy is that he he's Thane of Glams already. That is his current title. He will be given Thane of Calder and King hereafter. So obviously we know this is a bit of dramatic irony here for us, the audience, because we know he's already been given this title by the king. Um is told that his children will be king. And it's very interesting if you look at the characterization of Macbeth. He is said to be wrapped by the witches at this point in the play. Ross and, and um, Lennox, our noblemen, arrive and they tell Macbeth that he is Thane of Cawdor. Of course, Macbeth is like, oh my God, the witch's prophecy has come true. I'm going to. <laughs> As you do, trust the supernatural evil being. Meanwhile, Banquo is really cautious and thinks, hmm, maybe we've eaten on the insane route. <laughs> maybe this is all an illusion. He doesn't quite, he's not as gullible or naive as Macbeth. Then, dun dun dun, Duncan announces Malcolm, his son, will inherit the throne. So, of course, Macbeth is like, well, hang on a second. I've just become Thane of Order. I thought you said I'm going to be the king. So, he, he announces Malcolm as a step of time to overleap. And, you know, it's quite um, linking there to Macbeth overleaping or over ambition, his fatal flaws, as Miss said earlier. 
So the second half of Act One is where we're introduced to another key character, which is Lady Macbeth. Macbeth has written to her, telling her about the prophecies and the fact that he's now been given the title of Queen of Cordor. And this sparks her ambition too. And now she's absolutely determined to make sure that he achieves his uh, destiny to become king, obviously her destiny to become queen. So as she reads the letter, she says, oh, hide thee hither, meaning come here quickly, so I can pour my spirits in thine ear. In other, way, in other words, she's going to persuade him to kill Duncan to make way for him as king. Mm, and I love that, your very first scene of meeting Lady Macbeth, she's reading the letter plotting to kill the king. Mm, yeah, so from the start, you can tell that she's not exactly um, the nicest character. Um, and then so she tells Macbeth, right, what we need to do is act like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. An absolutely key quotation. If you remember nothing else from the play, this is one that you absolutely must know, because it's that theme of duplicity, of being two-faced, of appearing to be loyal, but underneath be plotting against somebody. Um, and Lady Macbeth follows her own advice in the next scene, when Duncan arrives to stay at their castle, and she pretends like she's a perfect hostess, when in reality, she's planning on murdering him. And I love that scene because it shows that Lady Macbeth knows how she's supposed to act as a woman in Shakespeare. Mm. But and she's very good at faking it as well. She's great. <laughs> and then, mm -hmm. just before he's supposed to kill Duncan, Macbeth suddenly has doubts. And he thinks, oh, actually, he's been good to me. He's a good king. I have no real reason to kill him. I have only, um, no, what is no spur to prick the sides of my intent. Only vaulting ambition. Vaulting ambition, yes, the horse. But uh, yeah, so vaulting implying that, you know, it's jumping beyond where it should go. It's kind of dangerous. But Lady Macbeth arrives and she persuades him otherwise. She says, well, you're not a man unless you do it. She says, when you just do it, then you are a man. And somehow by saying that, she changes his mind. So by the end of Act mm -hmm. One, he is determined to kill the king and he has agreed to go ahead with it. Okay, so Act Two then. Well, Act Two opens up with um, we have Macbeth is preparing to kill King Duncan. But what's really, really interesting here is we have our first kind of um, hallucination or our first guilt inspired hallucination of the bloody dagger with the handle pointing towards his hand. So, Macbeth, we see the, the, the first embers of, of his fire of guilt, um, or possibly it's his guilt. Or could you argue that it is actually the witches and the supernatural mm. um, influence him even more? That's for you to decide, Year Eleven. That would be definitely a good argument to make if you were writing an essay on the supernatural. That here they're they're conjuring this image, this hallucination, to tempt him towards the murder. Then we have the next scene, it, uh, the murder has been committed. So obviously the murder is not shown on the stage because that would be just very disrespectful of the monarch at the time. So Macbeth actually commits the murder, but immediately we can see he regrets it because he cries out this very famous quotation, will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand? Um, so we have this, this motif of this, this hand washing to wash away his guilt. Then Lady Macbeth comes in and she wasn't on stage to hear Macbeth saying that about will all great men the ocean, wash his blood came from my hand. Very ironically then she comes in, oh, a little water will clear up this deed. You know, she's like, it's fine, wash your hands, don't feel any guilt, no remorse here. Mm -hmm. a very contrasting reaction to Duncan's murder. Then Macduff, our avenging hero <laughs> arrives um so he's been tasked with awakening king duncan and he goes in and he finds him dead so then we have um macbeth you know he's claiming him and lady macbeth have, have that whole plot where they claim it was the chamber or not the chambermaid the the chamber guards who killed macduff and macbeth then in his anger um slaughters the guards and lady macbeth whether she be cunning here or whether she's actually doing it on purpose, she faints. Tends to faint, or really faint. We don't know. That's up to interpretation. But either way, she distracts everyone from accusing Macbeth. Malcolm and Duncan then decide to flee because they know that they have not killed their father, King Duncan, and they know they are not safe and need to get out of there. 
So then we have this scene with Ross and the old man and this idea that Scotland is thrown into chaos. So we have, um, you know, this this divine, oh, what's it called? This divine, divine right of kings. Thank you. Divine right of kings, where God has chosen who the king is. But we have this idea that, that it's been disrupted, that nature has been disrupted and Scotland is thrown into chaos. Um, Duncan's horse eats each other. We have like what is it, a, a, a falcon or an owl eats a falcon and all this um this role reversal here um this help me out what else happens <laughs> uh well the sun doesn't come out during the daytime it's as if the night has eclipsed the day um the earth shakes there's extremely high winds and just everything's thrown into chaos it's almost yeah. like the end of the world yes yes so Macbeth deciding to usurp Duncan has defied the will of God and thrown the natural world, um, the natural order of the world into chaos. So to some extent, you could say Shakespeare, actually, he's like warning everybody, you know, don't try and kill the king mm -hmm. because you're going to mess up the world. Mm. Which is interesting because James I had just ascended to the throne at the time of Shakespeare writing this. So clearly he's trying to kind of ingratiate himself with the king by showing how loyal he was. So Act 3, uh, we learn that Macbeth has been crowned, so he is now the King of Scotland. The plan worked because obviously the, the natural heirs, Donald Bain and Malcolm, have fled. So the, the throne goes to whatever nobleman is deemed uh, worthy and they've chosen Macbeth. But he's not happy. He feels uneasy because he knows that it's not his line that will inherit his throne. It's Banquo's sons who will inherit the throne. And that really upsets him. And he has a whole monologue about how um, he's inherited a fruitless crown, a barren scepter. He's basically saying it's pointless. He's done all of these things. He's sacrificed everything to make Banquo's sons kings. And so what he decides to do then is to have Banquo killed along with his son, Leonce. And he hires a group of murderers to do this for him. So the murderer... I love, I love that he's, he's getting yeah. the murderers to do it. He's no longer getting his hands dirty. Yes, as he's sort of, he's gone up the hierarchy, he no longer has to do it himself, he can get other people to do it for him. And it's interesting, he comes up with an excuse, doesn't he? He says to the murderers, I would do it myself, but um, Banquo and I are mutual friends, and I, I don't want to lose those mutual friends. <laughs> <laughs> you just killed the king, my friend. Yeah, such a rubbish excuse. Well, it's just like when um, Macbeth kills Duncan, Lady Macbeth says, oh, I would have done it myself, but he looked too much like my father. So he's starting to mimic the behaviour of his wife here. But this is also a crucial development in Macbeth's character. You know, mm. there's no return. This is the pair of Paya. Um, once he's killed Banquo, you know, there is no coming back, is there? No. And this is the first time that he is actively choosing to murder somebody without anybody else influencing him. Lady Macbeth has no say in this. She doesn't even know it's happening. In fact, when she asks what he's planning, he says, be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck. He starts to patronise her. So there's a role reversal where he's becoming the active plotter and she's kind of a passive bystander. So while that's happening, the murderers have gone to kill uh, Banquo, as they've been told to. Macbeth is hosting a banquet for his nobleman. And at the beginning of that banquet, one of the murderers comes in and tells him that they've successfully killed Banquo, but they somehow allowed Fleance, Banquo's son, to escape. And following this news, Macbeth has a hallucination that Banquo's bloody ghost is sitting in his chair. So he can't sit down at the table and he acts absolutely crazy in front of all of his noblemen, shouting at this invisible ghost that nobody else can see. Thou canst not say I did it. Never shake no. Rory locks at me. So his behaviour is really embarrassing and he clearly is not very sane at this point. And you could argue that this is his guilt coming back to haunt him or you could argue that it's the supernatural sending the spirit to embarrass him at his own banquet. That's up to your interpretation. Do you know, I really like this scene in terms of staging because there's so many entrances and exits of Banco's ghost that it really adds to the tension and suspense. Um, you know, you have to remember also mm -hmm. it is a play at year 11. And there is an audience and it's made to be seen and, and mm. there in person, not just read off the page. So I think you have to you have to keep an idea of that in your head, you know, that alternating structure structure of a ghost coming on stage and off the stage. 
um, really highlights the fact that loss of control, you know, he's mm. living out of sanity. Yeah, absolutely. And some directors choose to have an actual actor playing Banquo and some choose not to. It's interesting because either way, it's quite effective. Not having him there kind of highlights the fact that it's only Macbeth that can see this and really emphasizes his madness. But having him there reinforces the bloodiness of it all because seeing an actual body covered in blood reinforces that theme of violence and death. Um, so at the end of this scene, Lady Macbeth ushers the guests out because she's embarrassed by his behaviour in front of all their guests. And once they've gone, Macbeth reflects that it's too late now. He can't go back. He can't undo what he's done. He says, I am in blood stepped so far that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as to go over. In other words, I've stepped so far in now. I've killed so many people. I can't undo it and I can't go back. It's too late. You could argue this is a warning. This is Shakespeare's warning to his audience that once you've done something evil, you then set yourself on a path for more evil. Okay, so Act 4 then. Act 4 opens up again with the witches. So what's really interesting with, with this scene with the witches is we have, well, we see Macbeth has decided, he has made the decision to seek out the witches because he wants to know more about his prophecy and his future. So the witches, this is where they have that lovely double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn and cauldron, bubble. Love that, 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 that rhyme and couplet, it's great. But um, we really see Macbeth's hubris is now his dominant character trait in this scene, actually, because he's really bold and he's given the witches commands. He's like, you know, like, tell me. Um, and he's mocking them when they repeat things three times. He's like, oh, if I had three years, I'd hear you three times. Um, he's, he's really different here than how he was in Act 1. So the witches, you know, they, they're like, okay, okay, we'll give you what you're asking for. And they give him his apparitions. So the first apparition is an armed head. Now, this armed head is warning of, like, rebellion or civil war. And they're saying, beware Macduff. And, of course, Macbeth is always like, he's like, oh, I knew Macduff was out to betray me. Then they tell, they show him a bloody child. And this is where we see this idea of equivocation coming in. So where the witches, you know, their, their meaning is unclear in what they're saying. So actually, the bloody child is where they say none of woman born can harm Macbeth. Now, that woman born um, should not be taken literally. Uh, and what they're actually referring to is the how Macduff was born of Caesarean. So this is where we see that equivocation, that bit of confusion. Um, and then the final apparition is, is um, oh gosh, what was it? It's a child holding a tree, is it, Miss? Yes, it's a, yeah, it's a young boy holding a tree branch. Yeah, yeah, and of course, this is referring to Malcolm and his army, um, where they cut down Burnham Wood and they're marching against um, Dunsinane. But the final one tells him, Macbeth shall never be vanquished and be until great Burnham Wood to hide Dunsinane and shall come against him. Love this. Which he thinks is impossible because it means that the whole forest would have to uproot itself and move several miles to the castle, which he thinks, well, that's never going to happen. Therefore, I must be invincible. <laughs> and I love it. They really seal his, um, again, his hubris, his, his mm. pride and confidence. So knowing all this, so Macbeth believes that he's invincible, invincible and no one can hurt him. Yet he still decides to send murderers to Macduff's castle. And not just to kill Macduff, he's like, oh no, his wife, his babe, all his servants, kill them all, put them all. So this is where you really see this kind of evil quality of Macbeth um, appear on stage. Macduff then, um, Macduff, he's an interesting character because he he is just seen as like, he, we like to call him Captain Scotland. <laughs> so in love with Scotland, he's all about Scotland. To the point there, like he's left his family to go. He didn't even tell his wife where he's going. He's just up and left them to go to England to get Malcolm because he's like, Scotland is in so much pain. I need to get Malcolm the true heir to come back and rescue us. Blah, blah, blah. Um, and then, of course, when he's in England, Ross, who goes down to England, tells him, actually, um, Macbeth has killed all of your family. And he's like, my wife, too, all my pretty chickens. <laughs> Yeah, he's devastated, isn't he? In fact, I 
um, a really interesting comment from a student the other day that Macduff could be seen as the new foil for Macbeth at this point. So you used to have Banquo, who obviously represented someone who's also given a prophecy but doesn't give in to the temptation, mm. but dies, so there's no longer a foil. And then Macduff is kind of introduced to the plot, and he's so dedicated and devoted and passionate about Scotland. Meanwhile, Macbeth is destroying Scotland, so you've kind of got a new foil in this character. I always think of him as like just that kind of stereotypical Avenger hero. You know, he's mm. like Duncan, and now he's like the one who's bringing the army on Macbeth. He's an like ultimate revenge and putting things right. Um, yeah, and now he, he obviously has reason to hate him even more, being given this news about his family. So Act 5 then starts with a very important scene, and this is one that you absolutely must look at if you ever talk about the character of Lady Macbeth. Um, here you see her sleepwalking. And as she's sleepwalking, she's repeatedly doing the action of washing her hands. And her serving yeah. lady has seen her do this several nights in a row um, and is concerned about her because she keeps saying really sort of um, concerning things about murder and death. And as she's washing her hands, she says, will these hands never be clean? She thinks she can never rid herself of the guilt of Duncan's murder. So clearly she's haunted with guilt. Clearly she does regret what she's done. But in previous scenes, we've never seen this vulnerable, weak side of her. So you could argue at this point that what's being exposed to us is the real Lady Macbeth and that everything up to this point was just a powerful facade, that she was just putting on an act of being strong when in reality she does have those feelings. And we haven't really seen her for a while now. You know, she's... she's no. been from most of the action of the play for some time and now she comes back in and there's this clear degeneration of her mind um you know she keeps like keep this compulsion and as i say that i'm here like rubbing my hands together <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. Her hands. and a change in the role of marriage and who she is she's like she's a shell of the woman she was mm. yeah as another warning shakespeare you commit murder you lose your sanity um, eventually, she can't bear the guilt any longer and she commits suicide. So Macbeth finds that out a bit later on in the act and he's very upset about that, obviously. And I think for Macbeth, knowing that Lady Macbeth is dead and knowing that most of his country hates him and wants to fight against him, it kind of triggers this um, existential crisis where he starts questioning the point of life at all. He says, you know, I've worked so hard and for nothing. Mm, that famous speech, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow favorite art mm -hmm. okay. as if it's all been pointless and, it, and repetitive and exhausting and what was the po point at the end of the day um and mm -hmm. as he's preparing for the battle against Macduff and Malcolm he's really showing mm -hmm. himself to be invincible he doesn't think that he can be defeated because obviously he's been told by the witches that no man woman born can kill him and he can't be vanquished until the wood has moved to his castle so he thinks well I'm never going to be killed but unbeknownst to him, the opposition have actually disguised themselves using tree branches. So from afar, it appears that the forest is moving, that the forest is making its way from where it originally was to the castle. So the apparition is coming true. Then when Macbeth finally comes face to face with Macduff, Macduff tells him that he actually wasn't born naturally from a woman, but was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. In other words, he there was an emergency and he had to be born by C-section. So he wasn't... <laughs> a moment of the play. Yeah, it doesn't really count as in, in terms of the apparition. It means that he's kind of exempt from that, which means he can kill Macbeth, and that is what he does. And then at the very end of the play, he comes in with Macbeth's head and um, announces that Malcolm will be the new king and the order is restored. And this is that moment of catharsis in the tragedy, you know, where everything is kind of released everything's put back to normal um it's worth noting that the play has a circular narrative because it begins and ends with a civil war and mm. it's ironic because Macbeth begins the play fighting against the rebellious Thanes and ends it with the Thanes fighting against him so it's this idea of order has been restored yeah and you can see his fall from grace and how he originally you know we, we saw him as a very admirable well-respected character and by the end he's known as what is it a butcher and his butcher, butcher. Yeah. 
you know, they 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 um celebrate his violence from the beginning. And this is I always argue. I'm like, really, did Macbeth change that much? Mm. Someone in hat at the beginning. But it was great when he was fighting on your side, but now he's fighting against you. Oh, he's a tyrant and he's evil. So I'm like, well, yeah. could you look at yourselves a bit? And from the very beginning, you could tell that he was, he was going to go against the natural order because they say he disdains fate. It says mm -hmm. disdaining fate when he was fighting against, is it McDonald, the, the rebel? Yes. At the very beginning of the play, he's disdaining fate. He's going against the natural order in order to win. Which is exactly what he then does by killing Duncan. So, yeah, the signs are all And you could argue that you can see that nature from the start so really does do the witches and lady macbeth really have that much influence on him because maybe he was inherently evil from the beginning yeah he was definitely violent <laughs> yeah that's for sure <laughs> um you know like myself and my girls in year 11 we decided that we were going to just do you know a 10 minute lecture and it's been 26 minutes so has it <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. uh, i think we'll end it there miss <laughs> yeah we'll send it there how do I stop the recording? <laughs> <laughs> For those three dots. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. There we go. Bye. <laughs>